The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss. Chapter Twenty Eight. Francis had soon become tired of playing with the long leaves his brother had brought him, and they were thrown aside. Fritz happened to take some of the withered leaves up, which were soft and flexible as a ribbon, and he advised Francis to make whiplashes of them to drive the goats and sheep with, for the little fellow was the shepherd. He was pleased with the idea, and began to split the leaves into strips, which Fritz plaited together into very good whiplashes. I remarked, as they were working, how strong and pliant these strips seemed, and, examining them closely, I found they were composed of long fibres, or filaments, which made me suspect it to be Formium tenax, or New Zealand flax, a most important discovery to us, and which, when I communicated it to my wife, almost overwhelmed her with joy. "'Bring me all the leaves you can without delay,' cried she, "'and I will make you stockings, shirts, coats, sewing-thread, cords. In fact, give me but flax and work-tools, and I can manage all.' I could not help smiling at the vivacity of her imagination, roused at the very name of flax, but there was still great space between the leaves lying before us and the linen she was already sewing in idea. But my boys, always ready to second the wishes of their beloved mother, soon mounted their coursers, Fritz on Lightfoot and Jack on the Great Buffalo, to procure supplies. Whilst we waited for these, my wife, all life and animation, explained to me all the machines I must make to enable her to spin and weave, and make linen to clothe us from head to foot. Her eyes sparkled with delight as she spoke and I promised her all she asked. In a short time our young cavaliers returned from their foraging expedition, conveying on their steeds huge bundles of the precious plant, which they laid at the feet of their mother. She gave up everything to begin her preparation. The first operation necessary was to steep the flax, which is usually done by exposing it in the open air in the rain, the wind, and the dew, so as, in a certain degree, to dissolve the plant, rendering the separation of the fibrous and ligneous parts more easy. It can then be cleaned and picked for spinning. But as the vegetable glue that connects the two parts is very tenacious, and resists for a long time the action of moisture, it is often advisable to steep it in water, and this, in our dry climate, I considered most expedient. My wife agreed to this, and proposed that we should convey it to Flamingo Marsh, and we spent the rest of the day in tying up the leaves and bundles. Next morning we loaded our cart and proceeded to the marsh. We there untied our bundles and spread them in the water, pressing them down with stones, and leaving them till it was time to take them out to dry. We could not but admire here the ingeniousness of the flamingo. They are of a conical form, raised above the level of the marsh, having a recess above in which the eggs are deposited, out of the reach of danger, and the female can sit on them with her legs in the water. These nests are of clay, and so solid that they resist the water till the young are able to swim. In a fortnight the flax was ready to be taken out of the water. We spread it in the sun which dried it so effectually that we brought it to Falcon's Nest the same evening, where it was stored till we were ready for further operations. At present we laboured to lay up provision for the rainy season, leaving all sedentary occupations to amuse us in our confinement. We brought in continually loads of sweet acorns, manioc, potatoes, wood, fodder for the cattle, sugar canes, fruit, indeed everything that might be useful during the uncertain period of the rainy season. We profited by the last few days to sow the wheat and other remaining European grains, that the rain might germinate them. We had already had some showers, the temperature was variable, the sky became cloudy, and the wind rose. The season changed sooner than we expected, the winds raged through the woods, the sea roared, Mountains of clouds were piled in the heavens. 
they soon burst over our heads, and torrents of rain fell night and day, without intermission. The rivers swelled till their waters met, and turned the whole country around us into an immense lake. Happily, we had formed our little establishment on a spot rather elevated above the rest of the valley. The waters did not quite reach our tree, but surrounded us about two hundred yards off, leaving us on a sort of island in the midst of the general inundation. We were reluctantly obliged to descend from our abode. The rain entered it on all sides, and the hurricane threatened every moment to carry away the apartment and all that were in it. We set about our removal, bringing down our hammocks and bedding to the sheltered space under the roots of the trees that we had roofed for the animals. We were painfully crowded in the small space, the stores of provisions, the cooking utensils, and especially the neighborhood of the animals, and the various offensive smells, made our retreat almost insupportable. We were choked with smoke if we lighted a fire, and inundated with rain if we opened a door. For the first time since our misfortune, we sighed for the comforts of our native home, but action was necessary, and we set about endeavouring to amend our conditions. The winding staircase was very useful to us. The upper part was crowded with things we did not want, and my wife frequently worked in the lower part at one of the windows. We crowded our beasts a little more, and gave a current of air to the places they had left. I placed outside the enclosure the animals of the country, which could bear the inclemency of the season. Thus I gave a half-liberty to the buffalo and the onagra, tying their legs loosely to prevent them straying, the boughs of the tree affording them a shelter. We made as few fires as possible, as, fortunately, it was never cold, and we had no provisions that required a long process of cookery. We had milk in abundance, smoked meat, and fish, the preserved ortolans, and cassava cakes. As we sent out some of our animals in the morning, with bells round their necks, Fritz and I had to seek them and bring them in every evening, when we were invariably wet through. This induced my ingenious Elizabeth to make us a sort of blouse and hood out of old garments of the sailors, which we covered with coatings of the kuchuk, and thus obtained two capital waterproof dresses, all that the exhausted state of our gum permitted us to make. The care of our animals occupied us a great part of the morning. Then we prepared our cassava, and baked our cakes on iron plates. Though we had a glazed door to our hut, the gloominess of the weather, and the obscurity caused by the vast boughs of the tree, made night come on early. We then lighted a candle, fixed in a gourd on the table, round which we were all assembled. The good mother laboured with her needle, mending the clothes. I wrote my journal, which Ernest copied, as he wrote a beautiful hand, while Fritz and Jack taught their young brother to read and write or amused themselves with drawing the animals or plants they had been struck with. We read the lessons from the Bible in turns, and concluded the evening with devotion. We then retired to rest, content with ourselves and with our innocent and peaceful life. Our kind housekeeper often made us a little feast of a roast chicken, a pigeon, or a duck, and once in four or five days we had fresh butter made in the gourd churn and the delicious honey which we ate on our cassava bread might have been a treat to European epicures. The remains of our repast was always divided amongst our domestic animals. We had four dogs, the jackal, the eagle, and the monkey, who relied on their masters, and were never neglected. But if the buffalo, the onagra, and the sow had not been able to provide for themselves, we must have killed them for we had no food for them. We now decided that we would not expose ourselves to another rainy season in such an unsuitable habitation. Even my gentle Elizabeth got out of temper with the inconveniences, and begged we would build a better winter house, stipulating, however, that we should return to our tree in summer. 
We consulted a great deal on this matter. Fritz quoted Robinson Crusoe, who had cut a dwelling out of the rock, which sheltered him in the inclement season, and the idea of making our home at Tent House naturally came into my mind. It would probably be a long and difficult undertaking, but with time, patience, and perseverance, we might work wonders. We resolved, as soon as the weather would allow us, to go and examine the rocks at Tent House. The last work of the winter was, at my wife's incessant request, a beetle for her flax and some carding combs. The beetle was easily made, but the combs cost much trouble. I filed large nails till they were round and pointed. I fixed them, slightly inclined, at equal distances in a sheet of tin, and raised the edge like a box. I then poured melted lead between the nails and the edge, to fix them more firmly. I nailed this on a board, and the machine was fit for use, and my wife was all anxiety to begin her manufacture. End of chapter.